thank you everyone for coming to the closing keynote presentation for the 2018 BC Craft Brewers Conference. I know that anybody in the know in this biz is really excited for who the guild and who the organizers have managed to bring in today. Our, our closing keynote speaker tonight is Dr. Bart Wilson. Dr. Wilson is the chief economist of the American Brewers Association. They actually have a chief economist, which is so rad for someone like me. It's the National Trade Association for America's Small and Independent Craft Brewers. Prior to joining the Brewers Association, he was a lecturer at the University of California, Berkeley, and a visiting assistant professor at the University of Iowa. A self-proclaimed beer geek and beer lover, Dr. Watson is also a certified Cicerone. He holds a PhD from Berkeley, where in addition to his dissertation, he compiled a comprehensive survey of Bay Area brew pubs, one pint at a time. We are all absolutely delighted that Dr. Watson was able to join us here and come talk to us. So without further ado, I'll hand things over to him. Please join me in welcoming our closing keynote, Dr. Bart Wilson. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks for the introduction. Um, it's been in great to, to get to meet uh, some of the BC community here today. Uh, thanks to Ken um, and uh, the whole BC Craft Brewers Guild for inviting me. Um, super excited to be here and, and to have an excuse to, to get back to Vancouver and try a whole bunch of your beers. So um, one, one other reason that I'm excited to be here is, is we're big fans of BC um, in our house. Um, I actually have a picture to prove this. My daughter's best friend is from British Columbia. Um, those of you from the interior will know this is Ogopogo. Um, and this is, this is her, her favorite stuffed animal, so uh, we're big BC lovers. All right, um, so nothing, nothing like an economics talk to close a day where you've been drinking a bunch of beer. Um, but what I'm gonna try to run through is, is kind of a high level overview of what's going on in the US, in Canada. Uh, we'll try to get narrowed down to BC some, but more general context. And, and I think we're gonna see a lot of similarities. So, um, you know, the talk that we heard this morning from, um, you know, BC government officials on the wholesale and the retail side, I think really set the stage for what I'm gonna talk about. Some of the things we've seen, the growing competitiveness out there, the massive proliferation of breweries, and we're gonna delve into you know, what's going on there, how long can it continue, um, and what that means for you. And, and so here's kind of the basic layout. Uh, hopefully I'll convince you that where I don't have Canadian stats and I do have US stats, that those are pretty applicable because there's really a lot of market similarities between the US and Canada. Um, and as we'll all start to get into too, you know, talking about the US or Canada's markets is, is insane now because there's so much variation even within the countries, you know, within even a province, you know, Vancouver is, is not the interior. Um, we'll see that that brewery growth isn't slowing and I don't think it's going to anytime soon. Um, you know, people are amazed that breweries continue to open, but all signs point to uh, there being thousands more breweries in North America. Um, the sales growth is slowing. I think there's lots of signs of that. We saw that in some of the data this morning that those double digit growth rates that we had for a number of years just aren't sustainable in the long run. No industry grows like that forever. And as we move toward a more mature market, we're gonna see slower growth split um, amongst those, that proliferation of players. Um, the old order is being disrupted. I, I put old in quotes, because that basically means anything five years ago or older. Um, it's amazing how fast this industry changes. And, and hopefully this talk will convince you too that the pace of change is now faster than it's ever been. So not only are we seeing more change than ever before, but that change is occurring in, in shorter and shorter time periods. Um, local is, is so powerful, and what local is is constantly getting redefined too. We'll get into that. Channels are changing. Um, and this all stems from what drinkers want. At the end of the day, um, you know, we, we heard it this morning, it's, you know, it's not the, um, you know, the store that kicks you out, it's the consumers that kick you out. The consumers are the ones that are gonna decide, and we'll try to delve into some of those trends and understand what consumers want, and then give some basic variations on these themes. All right, and hopefully uh, I've left some time for q and I know we're running a little bit late, but I'm happy to stick around and, and do questions if people have them. So recent history, um, this is US, not Canada, but it, I think show, kind of shows the picture. Um, and by recent, I mean the last 150 years. So this is the number of breweries in the United States. Uh, from 1873 to, to 2017, we did that crazy thing with prohibition where you can see where it goes down to zero. Um, but this is, this is generally true of North America that you know, there were a lot of little breweries many, many years ago 
They basically went away. We saw this huge consolidation in the post-war period where national markets got built, big brands got built. Um, and then, you know, in the U.S., you can tie it to regulatory factors. In, in Canada, um, you know, the story is a little bit different, but we started to see percolations of a rebuilt brewing scene in the 80s and 90s. Um, the U.S. went through a slowdown in the late 90s, early 2000s. I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A. Um, that's something a lot of U.S. brewers have in their minds right now as we go into another slowdown. Um, and then we've seen this amazing explosion in breweries in the last couple of years. Um, there's now more breweries in, in the U.S. than there ever has been before, and I believe more breweries than there ever have been in Canada, or at least licensed breweries. Lots of people had very small breweries uh, historically. Um, this is the U.S. market to give some context for what these changes are, and, and these are in uh, thousands of hectoliters. So this is a 30-year view into what's gone on in the U.S. beer market. Um, and generally, I've broken it into three big buckets, small and independent brewers, Imports, which are a big part of the U.S. market, particularly Mexican imports these days, and then everything else. And what you see is over 30 years, there has been a massive change in the beer market. Small and independent brewers have gained about 30 million hectoliters in the U.S., massive amount of beer. Imports have also gained 30 million. And everything else, basically ABI and Molson Coors, have lost 50 million hectoliters of volume. It, you know, it's, it's mind-boggling to think about how much beer has shifted in 30 years. Um, and at the end of all this, the total beer market is basically static. You know, it's gained 10 million hectoliters in 30 years when the population has grown much more than that, um, which is actually not very impressive um, in population terms. And that means what we've seen is this huge premiumization. So this is that same data, and I've just broken it into three big price points. Red is everything that's above premium, so everything that's above the premiums and premium lights that have dominated the beer market. Yellow is those big brands. And blue is everything that came before. And I like this chart for two reasons. One, um, you see that now, at least in the US, those premium things are the largest chunk of the beer market if you break it into three, three parts. Um, and this is by volume, not in dollar sales. So if we looked in dollar sales, they would be even bigger. The other reason I like this is you see that these historical cycles happen and, and we've seen this before. So when premium and premium light took over in the US, they took over from another set of brands. The same thing happened in Canada. You know, the dominant Canadian brands took over from a set of smaller regional brands. Um, and we saw this flip in the beer market. So this tells us we maybe can get some insight into where this is going. Um, and I'm a big believer that that red line is going to get just as high as that yellow line got. Um, there's lots of people who are doing work on this now. But if you look at the percentage of somebody's salary that they can spend on certain beers, a lot of craft beers are now priced very similarly to the way premium beers were in the 60s and 70s. You know, Budweiser used to cost the same percentage of somebody's salary that a six pack of craft does now. Um, and so I'm a big believer that we're going to see this high end get to that 60, 70 share. And if you look at leading US states, it's already there. By volume, Vermont, 60, 70 share of volume is going to these high end things. You know, similar things in key markets like, like Denver and Portland. Um, the U.S. is a little bit different in that we gave up fuller flavor, much more so than Canada. Um, so one reason I think we've seen such an explosion earlier um, in the U.S. is that there was more pent-up demand. So this is data from Euromonitor, um, and I've just taken the, the, the y-axis there is the percentage of the market that they just put into lager. Um, and then so, you know, you can do the 100 minus and you can figure out, you know, the kind of fuller flavored portion of the beer market by volume. Um, and you can see that the U.S. has gained a lot more share in this in recent years, partly because it had a lot more room to grow. Um, you know, Canada has had fuller flavored, higher strength beers uh, and, and didn't give those up in quite the same way that the U.S. did. So I think that's one reason we have seen difference. But in recent years, you can see that those trends in growth are pretty similar. Um, here's a zoom in on, on the non lager beer market, again, from Euromonitor. I don't know what I think about this data, so I'm going to skip through this slide quickly. Um, <laughs> all right. People compare the US and Canada sometimes, and, and often I think they forget about the scale of the countries. So um, you know, I'm going to show a slide in a minute that often surprises people. When you look at the absolute number of breweries in, in both the US and Canada, um, the US has a lot more breweries in Canada. The US is a lot bigger than Canada, though, so this should not be surprising. Um, and, and you can see here's the U.S. numbers, the explosion. Uh, that red line is permits, so permitted breweries versus active breweries that we're tracking. Uh, typically runs about two years ahead. There's now almost 10,000 brewing permits in the U.S. But if we put this in per capita terms, the U.S. and Canada look pretty similar. So 
Um, this is divided by legal drinking age adults. So um, Canada, we've done by uh, 18 or 19, depending on you know, the province and, and what the drinking age is. Uh, the US, that's 21 plus. And in this regard, Canada actually has more breweries in the US, uh, which might be a surprise to some, some people in this room. Yeah, all right. And, and basically, the growth rates are very, very similar. So if you look at that percentage gap in 2012 and 2017, it's almost identical. Um, so in terms of number of breweries, the Canadian market and the US market are growing on very similar trajectories given their different population sizes. All right, a lot of dots in this one. This is every state and every province, and I've put in the number of breweries in the state or province, and then we've converted on the other line, the y-axis, is per capita, so per 100,000 21 plus adults. Um, that dot way far out on the right, that's California. California is bigger than Canada in terms of population, so it's not surprising that it has a lot of, a lot of breweries. So, so here's taking California out. We've zoomed in a little bit. You can see it a little bit better. Um, I like this for a couple of reasons. One, it shows that there's still huge variations place to place. Mississippi and Alabama are not Oregon or Colorado, are not BC. And, and you know from you know, being here that BC is not the other provinces in Canada. So talking even about a Canadian market doesn't make a whole lot of sense, particularly as we're gonna delve more and more into how important local is. Um, put your guess in, you, know, you may know and be tracking this, where you think BC is on this. All right, there's BC. Um, so a couple things here. Yeah, there's a lot of breweries in BC. Um, this, is, this is the 2017 numbers. I've been hearing more like 170 now active if we, if we updated this. Um, but in per capita terms, you know, it's ahead of some states, but it's really kind of middle of the pack when we look at this North American distribution of, of places. Um, two US states that you know, might be good comparisons if you're thinking about building models that I put right there, Minnesota and Wisconsin, both pretty similar in, in total number of breweries um, and in breweries per capita. So uh, if, you, if you like doing economic modeling, they could be good ones to, to get data from and look at. Um, here is map, just because I like maps, and Excel has this cool new tool. So um, you can see BC there. Um, again, kind of middle of the pack. And you can see, though, that there's plenty of states and provinces that BC has more breweries than and plenty that it has you know, fewer than in terms of uh, per capita. Um, that said, um, you know, when people look at per capita stats, you know, often the follow-up question I get is, you know, how many breweries would we have when we catch up to Vermont? Or how many breweries would we have when you know, we catch up to whatever you know, leading province you want to pick here in Canada? Um, and my answer is I wouldn't expect a ton of catch-up. When you look at this over the long term, states and provinces pretty much tend to stay in their lanes. You don't see, you know, everybody's rising together right now. We saw those US and Canadian lines of per capita terms going up, but you don't see huge changes. You know, Alabama doesn't become Colorado, and Colorado doesn't become Alabama. So this is the most mathy slide, I promise. It's the only one that has an equation. <laughs> and what this shows is states, and I've got their licenses per capita in the year 2000, and then how much growth they had in the last two years, so between mid-2016 and 2018. And what that equation tells you is you can predict 60% of the change in the last two years based on a data point from almost 20 years ago. The states that were ahead 20 years ago are the states that are getting the most breweries now. And so these things are very path dependent based on regulation, based on demographics, and you shouldn't expect BC to get a lot better or get a lot worse in comparative terms over time. It's going to be the place it's gonna be. It's one that you know, it's a market you know, but don't expect it overnight to be, you know, Vermont or a leading, the leading place in North America. And at the same time, it's probably not gonna fall off the map because we see historically that these things don't change too much. All right, I always like closing this section because I've talked a whole lot about the number of breweries um, to tell you that the number of breweries really doesn't matter. People are focused on the number of breweries because it's a big, bold number that they can think about. But when you look at how big most breweries are, most of them are really, really small. And I don't have as fine-grained data in Canada, so I only have the US data here. Um, but this is US breweries broken into size, and, and this is in barrels, not hectoliters. But that red line is the percentage of breweries they represent, and those yellow bars are the percentage of beer they make. So in the US, 75% of breweries collectively make 0.6% of the beer that's made in the US. If you throw in imports, that means 75% of the breweries all added together make less than one out of 200 beers that are sold in the US. And I don't have the Canadian data to back it up, but I would guess it's almost exactly the same. 
that we see this huge long tail. And so how many breweries can a city or a town place? Well, if they're making one out of 200 beers, it can take a lot. And that's what we're seeing. I mean, we saw this in the growth today, that micro tail, people selling direct on site, you know, the lounges here in BC, that's where the numbers are. And so don't be confused by the numbers. Think about what those breweries actually make. And as you're starting to factor in, you know, how many breweries can a place take, how much they make is going to be much more important. Could you take, you know, 50 more regional breweries in BC? No. Could you take 50 more small pubs if they're located in a neighborhood that doesn't have one or a small town in BC that doesn't have a brewery yet? Probably. Um, so the number is much less important than interacting that with how much beer they make. All right. Beer time. Next section. You're not in the beer business. You're in the beverage alcohol business. And hopefully in the next 10 minutes I will convince you that you should broaden your thinking about your business not just as a brewery but as part of the beverage alcohol business. This is US data but you see very similar things in Canada. Per capita consumption of beverage alcohol doesn't change very much over time. Yes, if you look at it in historical terms, in the 1800s they drank a whole lot more than we do now. But, you know, year over year, people's consumption of beverage alcohol doesn't change very much. Um, I won't say that it's recession proof, but it's certainly recession resistant. Um, and similarly, even in really good times, you don't see beverage alcohol spending or uh, consumption spike an incredible amount. So this is in the US. Um, beer, wine, and spirits are all stacked there. They've just been converted into drinks. Um, and you can see that it's pretty steady, about two and a half gallons of, of, of ethanol per person per year. So what changes is what they're drinking within that bucket and how many people there are. So demographics certainly can change the size of a market as you get more people moving in or their ages, they can change it. Um, but what people drink is really a competition between beer, wine, and spirits at all time. And it's one that beer's losing at the moment. Um, as we saw from that long-term historical trend, most of that is being lost out of the large multinational brewers, out of lager and light lager. That's where the volume losses are mostly occurring. Uh, but Canada and the US are almost identical on this. Uh, this is liters per legal drinking age adult. And um, over the last you know, five, six years, Canada and the US have lost almost exactly uh, the same amount of volume. Um, I was surprised to learn this, that, that the US drinks more beer per capita um, than Canada. I would have, I would have not thought that. Um, would you say? Yeah, yeah, because yours is stronger. Maybe we could control for ABV, that would take care of it. So. Um, uh, wine consumption is much higher in Canada than the U.S. We're, we're, you know, we're not sophisticated, so I guess we stick to beer. <laughs> One reason we're seeing this consumption drop is that the median age is growing in both countries. So this is the median age in the U.S. and Canada, and you can see it going up similarly. Um, and if you look at demographics and how people drink, typically people drink less beer as they get older. Um, Everybody drinks less as they start to head into retirement. They have less money. Your body doesn't process alcohol quite as well. Um, but over time, you can see that people just generally dr drink less beer as they get older. And so if we decompose this, you know, why are people drinking less? About 30% of why people are drinking less is purely due to age factors. So this is based on US data. I just took everybody, divided them into you know, age groups from 21 to 85, assigned them an index of how much beer they drink, and then just moved that forward over time for a few years and said, all right, how much would we expect beer volume to go down just purely based on the fact that the US population is getting older? And about 30% of the drop we've seen in beer consumption is purely due to that age effect. And, and my suspicion, I don't have as fine-grained Canadian data, is the exact same thing in Canada. You're going to see that beer consumption go down over time because as people get older, they tend to drink less beer. Now, there's an opportunity for everyone in this room to change that. There's not, no divine right that says people as they get older suddenly have to drink less beer. This is something that you know, the big beer companies have marketed very exclusively to 21 to 34 year olds, party lifestyle, people associate beer with that younger. You know, we as a community can certainly start to change that and we are. You know, beer is something you can bring to a sophisticated dinner party. It's something you can have at a nice restaurant, but it's something that people need to be conscious about and working on. One of the other reasons that we've seen beer lose volume in both the US and Canada is that its price has gone up a lot more than other products. Um, so this is in uh, the US. Um, this is just off premise, so you know, packaged stores. Um, data from the, the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is the best price index in the US. Um, and you can see that beer has gone up in price. That's a yellow line, much more than wine or spirits. Exact same thing in Canada. Beer has gone up in price on average. Uh, this is from Statistics Canada, a lot more. 
Um, so if I was to give two big reasons why beer has lost volume, you know, there are a lot of stories about this in the US. I don't know if they make your press quite as much. It's people are getting older and beer relative to wine and spirits costs more money than it did 15 or 20 years ago. And it doesn't take a fancy economist to know that one thing costs more relative to another thing that we've seen are substitutes, then people are going to shift to the cheaper thing. Um, On-premise is a little bit different. So in the US, actually, uh, beer has gained less price on-premise than wine or spirits as fancy cocktail culture has come around. Um, and in Canada, beer has gained more price, um, but that gap is much, much smaller. And what this has meant is that we've seen draft share go up in the US. Um, I wasn't able to track down this data for Canada, but I would suspect that we've seen the same thing, that as a percentage of production, draft is going up in Canada um, over time, mostly because the losses have come much more from packaged than from draft. Draft in the US is basically constant in volume and has been for 15 or 20 years, whereas almost all the volume lost has come from package sales. I'll skip that one. All right. So people are drinking differently than they used to. Again, this all starts with the consumer. So another reason that beer has lost volume, we have price, we have age, is that the youngest generation drinks a lot more wine and spirits than they used to. This is US data. Um, but I think it, it applies broadly and wouldn't in North America, uh, you know, more broadly. You can see this is an index of consumption in the past seven days. Um, liquor is up there past beer for 21 to 29 year olds. That's something that if you watch this data over time has never happened before. Um, some of its price, we've seen that liquor has held price much better, um, at least in the US. Um, but some of this is just generational change. You don't drink what your parents drank, or your grandparents drank. People want to drink differently um, and we're seeing this move into spirits at the moment. That said, again, I think there's an opportunity here. This is, this is the glass is half full. Um, 25 to 34 year olds, that is craft's key demographic. And in both the US and Canada, we have pretty big cohorts moving into this age demographic at the moment. Um, and so they think, again, there's a huge opportunity as people have a little bit more money in their pocket, they want to be a little more sophisticated to fight this narrative that as you get older, you move out of beer and you move into more sophisticated things like wine and spirits. We can move people into beer even if spirits has had them at 21 to 24. Beer is now the sophisticated option um, and should be for, for this generation as they get older. Um, here's just some more demographic data. This is again US, but um, 21 to 24 year olds, um, and, and these are indices, so 100 means that group drinks the same percentage as their percentage in the population. Um, if it was lower than 100, it means they drink less. And if it's more than 100, then they drink more. And the peak demographic for craft age-wise is 25 to 34. Um, I'm sure some of you see this in your tasting rooms. You're not in the beer business. You're in the beverage alcohol business. This is my final pitch on this. Um, this is the percentage of craft drinkers who drink other things. Yellow line is they drink craft at all. Red is that they drink uh, craft weekly. So these are core craft consumers. Increasingly, what you see across a whole bunch of data is that people aren't beer, wine, or spirits drinkers anymore. They're cross drinkers. They drink all three. For people who drink craft weekly, a majority say they also drink spirits weekly. For people who drink craft weekly, a majority also say they drink wine weekly. So what does that mean for you as a business? When somebody walks into a bar or into a store, they're not just thinking, am I going to drink you know, this beer or that beer? They're thinking, what beverage alcohol category am I going to buy? And I think there's huge opportunities to give them cues across category that reflect back to your brand. And we see people doing this very, very well. You know, barrel-aged beers, very, very popular. A lot of them have spirits cues. We're seeing a lot of brewers in the US start to do beers that have wine must added, or other kind of beer-wine hybrids to bring in some of the wine drinkers. I think these are the types of things that all businesses should be thinking about, knowing that this generation doesn't think in categories in quite the same way. They think across beverage alcohol, and they're much more flexible in what they're drinking and in different occasions. And so I think there's opportunities there to use that to our advantage, because beer is a very flexible beverage that can really take on some of these other cues. Um, the number one reason people say they're drinking less craft is that they're drinking more of other adult beverages. Um, again, US data, but I think that would probably hold pretty well. It's more important than healthy lifestyle, which we hear about a lot, and more important than price. Yes, those are important, and those are reasons why people drink less craft. But the number one reason is that they're drinking more of other adult beverages. All right. Um, next up, craft growth. So this is US. Um, you know, there, there's an equivalent craft growth number in Canada. Um, and, and my sense is that Canada is kind of following the US by a few years. So the growth is still a little bit stronger here um, than in the US. But, but this is what happened in the US. And I think you know, it should be something that everyone in the room sees that 
you know, these meteoric rises just can't go on forever. And so we saw eight out of 10 years with double digit growth in the US. Um, and then very quickly we've moved to mid single digits. And this is the US picture again. Um, and this is kind of a, a good way and a bad way to look at it. So that red bar is the absolute growth. So in the US, 5% growth is still a lot of volume. It's a big industry in the US. So 5% is, is more than a million barrels, so, you know, a million and a half hectoliters a year in, in total growth. That said, that yellow line is that growth and it's divided by the number of brewers. And this is going to be equally applicable in Canada. I think there's as much growth in Canada as there ever has been, but it's now being divided up by more players than it ever has been. And so that same amount of growth is not going to be as much to go around for every brewer. And that's just a factor of numbers that, that isn't going to go away anytime soon because the number of breweries, as we've seen, is, is, is continuing to rise. And there's still lots of active breweries coming online. The growth is also changing where it's occurring. Um, and here, again, I'm going to rely more on US data, but I think we can mix in some Canadian data. People are looking to drink differently than they did in the past. So this is on-premise. And you can see that those declining occasions, this is from Nielsen, are what we would think of as traditional on-premise going to a bar, going to a restaurant. And those growing occasions are much more experiential. People don't want to just go and drink anymore. They want to go do something and drink while they're doing it. They want to go to a premium bar. They want to go to a brewery. They want to go to a festival or an event. That means that where we're seeing the slowdown the most is in broader distribution. This is from, uh, in the US, the National Beer Wholesalers Association. Uh, tracks a lot of the, the beer that goes through wholesale. And every month they ask every wholesaler in the country, are you buying more of this, less of this, or the same amount? If everybody has their thumb in the air and says I'm buying more, that's 100. If everybody says I'm buying less, it's a zero. And if you get a 50, that means the same number had their thumb up and the thumb down. Craft's still above 50, but it used to be at 90. We're seeing lots of distributors that are full. And you know, here it's a very different system. You, know, you, have, you have state. Um, but there's a lot of skews that we saw this morning. They're going up pretty remarkably. Um, and so a lot of these places are getting full and these distributed channels just can't grow anymore. There's only so much shelf space. There are only so many tap handles. Um, this is the number of bars in the US. I, I looked but could not find a comparable statistic. It's pretty steadily declined over time. Um, and one thing I was able to find is that there's almost the exact same number of per capita bars in Canada and the US. Um, they're very, very, very close, actually. Um, so I would guess that you've seen the same type of decline over time in the number of, of places that are just on-premise drinking establishments. That means that the growth is distributed very differently than it has been in the past. So this is US scan data. And so taken from supermarkets, you know, broader distribution. Um, and what I've just broken it down is by the size of the brewery on the left. And these are all just small breweries, so this doesn't include AB or Miller Coors. And then their growth rate. And the specific numbers are kind of irrelevant, but the trend is clear. The smaller you are, the faster you're growing. And you know, regional and national craft brewers at this point are, are struggling for growth in the US. Um, here's the, uh, the, the BC uh, LBD allowed me to steal a few of their slides um, so I could put it in. These are the same ones from this morning. And you can see you know, kind of similar trends, that the percentages um, in, in broader distribution really aren't growing. Um, and where you're seeing growth, this is for the regional brewers. Um, you know, is, it, it's tough. It's tough out there. Um, these numbers are growing. Um, this is just in BC. I, I'd be really interested to get a picture of growth from these breweries outside of BC. Because uh, what we're seeing in the US is a lot of regional craft brewers are actually still finding a lot of growth in their home markets. And where they're struggling is when they go further afield um, and they're, they're suddenly competing with a whole bunch of small, nimble competitors. Again, where people are drinking is very different than they were. So this is a percentage of occasions broken into type of beer and age. And I want to draw your attention to the bottom right, that craft millennials. So what this says is if, if you think of the beer business in terms of on-premise and off-premise, in the US at least, for a craft drinker who's a millennial, a quarter of their occasions are now something that isn't neatly fit into on-premise or off-premise, but is in this third space channel. And those are probably, from a branding you know, and, and brand building purpose, the most important occasions. Those are the ones where you know, they're having a great time, where it's memorable, where they're thinking about it. So you know, music festivals, tasting rooms, um, you know, those, those, those experiential occasions that we talked about before. That means that growth is distributed, again, very differently. Um, this is from the US. And we just took that 1.2 million barrels of growth, and we broke it into when that brewery was founded. 
Now, if you're a new brewery in BC and you're growing really fast, you know, seeing that 2014 to 2017 growth rate and how much growth there was for small breweries in the US, that's great. But pretty quickly, you're going to be in that left column. And what we're seeing is that as you get, you know, you're no longer the new kid on the block, it's harder and harder to maintain relevance, particularly as a whole new crop of breweries pops up. What happens when there's another 100 breweries in BC and they're all getting their, you know, 500 hectoliters of growth right off the bat? Suddenly that pie shrinks a little bit more and it's harder for the existing breweries to, to stand out. This is all driven again by the consumer. Um, how important is local in your purchase decision? Um, craft, it's the most important beverage alcohol, more important than overall beer or wine and spirits. Um, that wine question really varies if you do it by geography. So it's more important to people in places where there actually is good wine. Um, I'm, I'm from Iowa. Iowa is not known for its wine. I went to an Iowa winery once. We tasted through terrible wine after terrible wine. And we tasted one that was great. And I asked the winemaker, what, what's different about this one? He kind of looks at me sheepishly and he says, well, that's the one where we get the grapes from California. <laughs> so, you know, wine, because it's distributed geographically in very tight places, I think is going to be less. One thing to note here, and we heard this this morning, you know, distillery licenses, that advantage may start to go away. There's a lot more local options there used to be. I mean, you already have that with wine here in BC, but those local distilleries we're seeing pop up all across North America as well. That'll be another form of competition. Um, this means it's hard to be relevant outside your home market. Um, this isn't sa sales data, this is just Google Trends data. I just picked two breweries, you know, one here in BC, one not in BC, and, and just looked at their Google Trends by province. Um, both these breweries, I believe, are sold in the other provinces. Um, so you can see how hard it is to be relevant outside. And I just picked two. So now imagine you're a brewery in BC and you're going into you know, Ontario or Quebec, and there's 50 breweries that people are more excited about, interested in, than your brewery because they have that local advantage. This is the challenge we face. And um, I do this in the US with Sierra Nevada because everybody loves Sierra Nevada. There's nothing bad you can say about Sierra Nevada. They, they, they can do almost no wrong. Um, and they're outsearched in some small states far away from them by really tiny breweries you've never heard of. And you know, there's often then several dozen of those breweries in a state that you know, Sierra is having to compete with. And yes, they have certain advantages and they have great beers and great brands. But that's the, that's the market we have today. The further you move away from home, the harder it is to be relevant. Um, again, at home, you know, domestic BC uh, beer is doing great. So, um, you know, if there's one piece of advice out of this, I, I try to stay away from advice. I like giving data and letting you make your own choices. But if there's one piece of advice, go deep before you go wide. Those, you know, it's going to be easy to really defend that home market. You know, the, clo the tighter you can be here in BC, the better you can do um, in your home market. That's going to be much easier in five years when there's another hundred breweries in those other provinces to defend um, than, than things that are all the way across the country. All right. One of the good things about this experiential is that people really like coming to your brewery. So this is US data. This is the percentage of, of craft drinkers who said that they visited a brewery last year and the number they visited. 20% um, of craft drinkers say they visit five plus, they do five plus brewery visits a year. Um, we could extend this out too. There's a fairly significant percentage who do 20 plus. You know, those are the people who are going into a, a brewery every weekend. Um, this turns into a lot of volume. Um, this is in the U.S., this is in barrels, but last year direct at the brewery sales in the U.S. were 2.5 million barrels, that's about 3 million hectoliters. In, in 2018, they're going to be about 3.5 million hectoliters, direct at the brewery sales. And you can see what that curve looks like. It's, it's rising very significantly. Um, again, taking from the, the data this morning, um, the fastest growing percentage on here is that manufacturers on site. This is driven by the drinker. You see it across country. People are excited to go and have that experience, to learn about a brewery, where the beer is made. Uh, the, the cult of freshness is upon us. People you know, really believe that they're getting the best beer regardless of, of all sorts of other things, if they're drinking it right at the source. Um, and there's going to be a lot more growth there. That puts pressure on you know, distributed on-premise. That puts pressure on a lot of other things. Um, some of this is incremental is the good news. This is a survey we did where we asked people, if you're going to breweries, is this different than a traditional visit? Um, or is it, you know, is it a time when I'm deciding between going to a bar or just going to a brewery? And about two-thirds of people say that their uh, visit was something different than going to a bar. Again, this is, this is a different type of drinking than we've seen in the past. People want to go and learn. They want to go and experience something. They're bringing their family. Um, it's not, you know, um, going to a, to a dive bar and having, you know, a shot and a beer like it was, uh, you know, 15 or 20 years ago. Um, 
One reason I say this is we see that the demographics can be very different for these brewery visits. And if you're thinking about investing in your tasting room, I would urge you to think about it more broadly. How can you create a space that lots of people across age and gender want to come into? So this is the percentage of people who said two things. I drank more craft last year, and going to a brewery was a reason why. So if I hadn't gone to breweries, I wouldn't have drunk as much beer. 16% of men, 21 to 34, said that. That's kind of our typical demographic. 19% of women, 45 to 54, said that. Now, granted, that's a much smaller chunk of overall craft drinkers, because these had to be craft drinkers to be selected into this sample. But I think it shows that if you build an inclusive environment, you can get different people into your brewery, and you can build the category at the same time. That's how beer starts to reverse that decline. And the great thing is that they tell us once they visit your brewery, they buy more of your beer. How do you decide when you go to one of those really crowded shelves in a beer store these, day, these days what you're going to pick? One, one reason is I've been to that brewery. I've had an experience. I know something about that. When I bring it to the dinner party, I can tell them about the time I visited the brewery and the thing I learned there. So, this is not just something that you should be focused on because it you know, is great margin and it's nice to you know, sell beer you know, over the bar, um, but it can be, have real value added in distribution as well. All right. Two more short sections and, and then you can return to the heavy drinking. <laughs> um, first, I, I just want to do a little bit on styles. Um, don't have Canadian data here, but I think it's still interesting and instructive to see what's going on in the US. Um, so uh, I've titled this slide, America's Hooked on Hops. Um, the six styles that I've bolded are 40 share of volume in the U.S. American IPA, American Pale Ale, Imperial IPA, Session IPA, Fruit IPA, and English IPA. Um, somebody right now is coming up with a new style of IPA that we've never heard of um, that will involve ingredients that we can't even comprehend. Um, IPA is, is still the strongest growth driver in the U.S. But what we see if we look at the growth styles in the U.S. right now is that there really started to be a, a turn and that we started to see many more sessionable styles popping back up. We saw the age demographics. People are aging. It's a lot harder to drink double IPAs all night and then get up and go to work the next day if you get a little bit older. Um, and so five of the top 10 growth styles right now are, are things that would you know, look pretty at home in any you know, macro brewer's uh, portfolio. American Lager, Blonde Ale, Wheat Ale, Kolsch. Sour ale, and, and that sour ale is driven very heavily by Sea Quench, which we haven't had. It's a dogfish head beer, very light, sessionable. It's a blend of Kolsch, Berliner Weiss, and Gosa, um, but very much a, a light, you know, easy drinking beer that they market as such. So, you know, is the U.S. a predictor of the future up here? I don't know, but we really have started to see this turn where the big, bold styles are starting to swing back. That pendulum over time, if you watch craft, often swings back and forth between kind of punchy in the face things and things that are a little bit more subtle. And we've certainly seen sessionability return to uh, growth in the US. All right, I had to do a couple of slides on cannabis um, since I was coming at a time when I, I think it's been chatted about a lot at the conference. And I'm here to tell you that so far from the data I have seen, cannabis does not have an effect on beer sales. Um, this is data from the US. I've taken the state shipments, which is a good indicator of, of growth. And I've broken them into three buckets. Uh, limited, which is a euphemism for illegal. <laughs> medical, so medical use is legal. And adult use, so full recreationally legal. And what you see is that you know, beer is losing volume in the US, but it's losing volume the slowest in the states where there's the most marijuana. Flipped around, that means beer, growth, beer is the strongest in states where marijuana is the most accessible. And this is controlling for population changes. Um, so this is, so you know, I, I quipped at a conference, and of course, this is the only thing the beer media reported about afterwards, that if we wanted to improve beer volumes, maybe we should just make marijuana legal everywhere in the US. Um, but US state legalization doesn't appear to have a strong effect. That said, it might in the long run. Um, so, you know, this is not a, you know, something where you can, you know, build your long-term forecast and say this isn't going to have an effect, just we haven't seen anything in the short run. Also, I think people focus way too much on the, is this going to drag my sales down? And not enough on the secondary factors. So, you know, I've titled this Economic Ripples, but there's lots of other ways that the cannabis industry is going to affect your business over time. What about Hopland? Cannabis plant and Hopland are pretty similar. This is a map of all of, the hop, uh, all of the cannabis farms in Washington. It's all the licensed locations for, for cannabis grows. 
You zoom in on Yakima, there's a lot of them right in and around, around Yakima. What happens when that grows enough that suddenly hop prices have to go up because acreage prices go up because they're pressuring? Uh, warehouse space. The biggest complaint I hear from brewers in Denver post legalization is they can't get warehouse space anymore because people want to do indoor grows or they're, they're building out their facilities. Uh, labor talent. There's lots of you know, 21 year olds who would, you know, 10 years ago, would have immediately gone to the beer business who now have a choice. Am I going to be a bud tender? I don't know if they use that word up here. That's, that's, that's the word we use in, in, in Colorado, bud tender, or am I going to be a bartender? Um, you know, that's, that's a legitimate challenge that we're going to compete for labor resources. Liability. Um, I don't know what the dram shop laws are up here, but you know, you don't want to be serving somebody and, and having them go out and cause an accident. How do you train your servers to do that when maybe they had an edible 15 minutes before they came in, even if they hadn't had any beer? Seriously, these are, you know, these are real issues that breweries are going to have to work on. Yes? What happens if, like, there is someone that is making a non-alcoholic cannabis beverage that's being distributed throughout Canada? How do we regulate that along with our beer? Like, what if someone has a beer that said, we eat beer, non beer, and then there's beer? Like, who gets to ship with it? I don't know. These are good questions. So, the basic point here is that, you know, you can look at the basic sales of cannabis and, you know, beer and try to say, is there an effect there? But I think a lot of the more important ripples that we're going to see on the beer industry are, are secondary effects. And so, you know, thinking about it just as, is this going to affect my sales or not, it is probably a little short-sighted. And there's other things that you should be thinking about um, in terms of how this affects your brewery going forward. All right. I think I had about 45 minutes, so I'd love to take any questions if there are any. Cheers. <laughs>question was within IPAs there's you know a multitude of flavors and we've seen this you know hazy juicy northeast style really take off certainly yeah you know that's that's a chunk of the growth it's if you break it apart in distribution it's still certainly more the traditional IPA more of a kind of a west coast piney version um, so hazy IPA is about 1% of US sales now by my by my uh, craft sales not not total beer sales but about 1% of total craft um, and growing, it, it might be 2% by the end of the year. Um, it's small, but they're, they're high value. I mean, they're, they're kind of, you know, very few breweries are doing it in distribution. So, I mean, there's kind of one in broad distribution in the U.S., hazy little thing. Think about how many IPAs are in distribution. I mean, there's thousands of IPA SKUs. So, I think they're big in attention, but they're a little bit smaller in share than people think because, you know, remember that the people who are unta on, untapped are not your average beer drinker. Um, so I think they get more attention of mind than they get share of throat. Other questions? And I'll be at the, uh, what's, the what's the beer science thing? Beer and science tonight if you have questions there. Yeah, one more, and then I'm sure people want to go drink. So In the U.S., a lot. Um, a lot are very content staying pretty small and locally focused. Um, obviously, you have to be in a state where you have a regulatory environment where you can do that. Um, but, you know, we used to see the typical progression was kind of 300, 750, 1200, 1600, and then kind of plateaued. Um, and that's scrunched in recent years. And so you see a lot of breweries that don't even get over that thousand barrel mark. Um, so, I would expect that if we look at this in a couple of years, you know, even if we don't keep getting the entrance, that we'd see maybe even a higher percentage below 1,000 barrels. All right. Why is Vermont so crazy? Why is Vermont so crazy? They have great regulation. They have a population that really likes local and supports all things local, in addition to all sorts of, you know, everything artisanal sells really well in Vermont. They're really wealthy and white. Um, which lines up with the demographics. Um, and they had a really robust homebrewing community um, as one of the earliest states. One of the earliest homebrewing um, things you can find in the U.S. Is, is from Vermont. I think that 
that's a good sign for a beer incubator is, is home brewing. So. And other than that, it's just all freaking luck, man. They got some good breweries there. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm, I'm quite uh, happy that I didn't do my presentation because it mirrored that kind of economics, particularly the XY one. So I'm glad uh, I didn't do that my thing I was going to do this morning. I am proud to say I am uh, someone in the over 55 demographic who drinks beer a lot. So uh, if you need a poster child, I am it. We're gonna get you out of here really quickly. I just have uh, a couple of th people that I really need to thank if uh, the new technology will work. Of course it won't. Uh, so I, I, obviously, Bart Watson, I'd like to thank you so much for coming. That was, I, I learned more in that 45 minutes than I've learned in about uh, 15, 20 years in the business. <laughs> Uh, so thank you. Wouldn't, there's, there's the gold standard that we want to get to in this country. We want that kind of granularity, that kind of information, that kind of power when we go to talk to people uh, in government and to the media and everyone else. That, that was spectacular. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I also want to thank uh, all the presenters and all the moderators for everything uh, they did. Thank you much for your time and for joining us. Thanks to all the volunteers. I was sp specifically happy to see how many people we had uh, from KPU, the Brewing School. Thank you very much for all the, the students who arrived. That was great. I don't think it's self-serving, but I am giving them an uh, assignment on Monday, and I, I'm hoping they're not sucking up, but I don't think they are. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, all of you for attending the AGM last night, and uh, that was excellent, and all of you for attending today. We, we were well over 100 more tickets than we were this year. We had 50 more suppliers, so that's just spectacular. I think the energy in here today has been just top drawer the whole day. Um, and thanks to West Coast Canning for feeding us last night, and uh, for 12 Kings for entertaining us with karaoke, and particularly some people who came off the shelf, possibly somebody from Powell River, who I didn't think was a rock star, but he is now. So, uh, though he may have been sleeping halfway through the day. Um, I'd also like to uh, invite everyone, I know you're coming to uh, Beard Science tonight at Science World, know that we are doing, because we're BC Craft Beers, what makes more sense to pair BC Craft beers, but white spot burgers and fries. And so please make sure that there, you, if you're hungry and we've kept you a little longer than we thought, uh, there is uh, the white spot in the bottom uh, and they've given us a smoking deal. So if you need to eat dinner, you can eat dinner there. Okay, so please go there. Um, and finally, um, I'd like to thank Carlos for his uh, great job of uh, being our MC today. The, the great job that he does for us all year, which I talked about last night and today. So uh, thank you so much, Carlos, for everything you did. I'd like to also uh, tell you, uh, I, this isn't possible at all, what we've been able to accomplish this year without the efforts of uh, particularly, and she's gonna hate that I'm gonna do this, but I'm looking at you, Monica Frost, and I want you to stand up. Monica has been... Uh, I can tell you that we couldn't have accomplished one quarter of the things that we have been able to do by hiring Monica about this time last year. So uh, you have made my life easier. I'm slightly less gray, or maybe not, but uh, I, she has been just a joy to work with, and thank you so much. And the other person that really needs to be thanked, and I want you to thank her tonight because she's already left today to go to the other venue, is Leah Hannigan with Vancouver Craft Beer Week. She, she's our event supplier. She's got the team out there, uh, including um, Kitty Kamen. Uh, and it, it's just incredible what these guys uh, are able to accomplish. It's seamless. Um, so thank you very much. Also wanted to just thank Cisco for feeding us all day. That was great. 
Um, there was charcuterie back there, but given by the amount of noise I heard, I think it's probably all gone. So if you please, we'll see you down at Science World. Plan a safe ride home. Plan a safe ride home from here to there. And we'll see you next year. Thank you so much for all attending. <laughs>